Am I the astronaut for telling a married woman her marriage sounds miserable? I, 45 female, attended a wedding a few weeks ago when a cousin, 55 female, was talking about how she wished I would marry. I heard the struggles of her marriage. She cheated. He took her back. They do everything he wants. She's given up her hobbies and learned to enjoy his. He controls the money and she works part time and she could never afford to live on her own, etc. For 20 years, I've heard how I should get married. I've always said it's not a priority, and if it happens, it happens. I've repeatedly said throughout the years, I enjoy being single. I've been proposed to multiple times, and I like living life on my terms. I can embrace my hobbies, which are expensive, have a great job, live on my own, have great friends, I travel, and I've had great LTRs. Long-term relationships? All right? Okay. I guessed it right. My life is full. I've been financially independent since I was 22. And she has never been financially independent. The entire family knows I'm generous with my time and money, whether it's a gift or helping somebody out financially without expecting repayment, electricity, groceries, school expenses, etc. Marriage has never been a priority to me. I finally had it with the comments and her not respecting my life. I finally told her I respect her opinions, but I felt like her marriage was that of convenience and sounded absolutely miserable to me. I would die a slow death if I was in a marriage like hers, all of which is true. I like being able to make my own decisions, and if the right person comes along, it's fine, but it's not a goal of mine, never has been. The look of shock on her face said it all. She didn't care for that and is painting me out to be mean. After 20 years of comments and pressure, I finally said what needed to be said to get the comments to stop. She couldn't fathom that somebody wouldn't want to have her life, and to me, it sounds like a prison sentence. She also can't fathom somebody could be happy living my life. So, am I the astronaut? Um, hell no. Hell, hell no. Yeah, Carrie Lee, this is, this is just honesty. Don't ask questions you don't want the answer to. And if she's been asking you why or pressuring you to get married and saying, you know, why, why haven't you get married? Why isn't, why isn't it a priority to be married? You love your life right now. And honestly, I think loving your life the way that it is, is fertile ground to meet somebody and have a successful relationship because there's no pressure on them. We've talked about that before, where you have to get to a place where you're happy and don't need someone else. And then that, that is the easiest way to have a successful, at least beginning to a relationship, because there is no pressure there. Finding someone else who is in the exact same position is like the ultimate recipe for success. In this case, I don't know if it's if it's like denial that, um, what was this? Her sister, her friend, cousin. Her cousin has so many restrictions on her life. I can't imagine that she's actually happy or she's convinced herself that she is. And maybe... You know, maybe that facade includes talking it up to other people. Maybe she has to talk it up to other people to to keep convincing herself that she's happy as well. Or maybe she is really happy with all the constraints that she has in her life. And good for her. That doesn't mean what works for you isn't going to work for everybody else. What makes you happy is not going to make everybody else happy. That's just not how it works. Everybody has their own priorities. They have their own definition of success. They have their own wants and desires and needs. It's not the same for everybody so somebody pushing their life agenda on you and you finally, after 20 years, snap and you're like, shut the fuck up. I don't want that shit. I'm happy. Your life sounds like hell. They had it coming. Did they not? Did they not? But it's also funny how in, in the question here, it's am I the asking out for telling a married woman her, her marriage sounds miserable. That's not really the part that uh, out of the couple of things that she said that that was more of a dig. I think it was the I would die a slow death in, in her life that's the part of the statement that's like, oh, you took it one step further. It didn't matter. She kept pushing for 20 years. What did she think was going to happen? I mean, based on previous experience, she thought you were just going to take it and nothing would happen. So you finally snapped. It's the first time that's happened. And, and there it is. It's Dusty Thunder, and here's another story for you. This one comes from the AITA subreddit as well and is titled, Am I the astronaut for not hosting my father at our home and for not paying for his hotel? I, Lily, 34 female, and Jason, 31 male, are getting married in August on a tight budget due to focus on saving money. 
I have student loans to pay off and recently bought a house, leaving little extra cash. My father, Mason, 62, wasn't very present in my life growing up after my mom. Beth, 60 female, divorced him 32 years ago. He missed birthdays and was absent during my upbringing. We're not accommodating any guests traveling for the wedding at our home due to limited space and wanting privacy on our wedding night. Understandable. My dad flying 3,000 miles with his wife for our wedding has two government pensions and his wife has a good job. He also works part-time for extra cash, making over $30 an hour. Despite his financial stability, he tends to over-discuss his finances with me and boasts about his wealth. However, when we visit, he often leaves us to pay for everything, insisting on expensive outings and meals. Even when I was a struggling university student, he would make me pay for my share or contribute to groceries for family dinners. During his visit last summer, he ordered extravagantly at restaurants and made my husband feel uncomfortable by expecting him to cover the bill. He even complained about using points to treat his grandson to a movie. My dad dislikes spending on others and goes to great lengths to avoid it. My father says he can only afford three nights at a hotel, which has upset my brother. He's angry that we're not hosting our father and his wife and that we're not covering their hotel costs for one to two nights. Jason and I feel it's unfair to pay for their stay when they take multiple trips to Mexico each year. While they have the right to spend their money as they wish, we believe that they should have budgeted for our wedding. We simply want our home to ourselves on our wedding night and the week leading up to it without the added stress of hosting them. Jason and I simply don't have the extra money right now. Despite explaining this to my brother, he's upset that we won't cover any nights for dad. I've made it clear that we won't discuss our finances further. Now my brother is calling me horrible, selfish, and cheap and refuses to believe me. He's pressuring me relentlessly and insists that I'm lying. He can be very mean when things don't go his way. Even my mother believes I should pay for my dad's hotel stay. Am I the astronaut for not covering my father's hotel stay or hosting him for our wedding? I paid my own way when he got married in Mexico and never expected anyone else to cover my expenses. I'm getting mixed responses from people and I'm not sure how to handle it. Any advice would be appreciated. I would say to you right now, OP, anybody who has an opinion on anything here, you have to look at their motive. And you have to look at the source of information that they have, right? Uh, your brother who is pissed off about it, why would he potentially be angry about this? Is it because if your father says he's not going to stay in a hotel room these two nights, there's a high likelihood he's going to be asking your brother to stay at his brother's house, maybe? Wink, wink. And your your brother doesn't want to deal with him. He doesn't want to have to host him. So, of course, he's pissed and trying to guilt you into doing it. That is a That is a high probability scenario here. Your mother, I don't know, I don't know what the the story is there, but but you are under no obligation to host anything for him, right? At this point, he is lucky that he got invited to the wedding. It sounds like so. If he wants to be there, he can figure it out. It is not your job to accommodate him. You have enough going on. It's the week of your wedding. It is not a big bougie all expense paid trip for everybody in the family and if it were he would be involved in paying for that so if he wants to be there he can suck it and suck it up and deal with it pretty sure he can use his points or whatever to cover a, a couple more nights in the hotel or yeah you can go stay with your brother or your mom let one of the people who are bitching about it do something about it rather than bitch at you about it I haven't heard any solutions from any of them yet. It's just, that, oh, yeah, you're an asshole. You should be doing this. Really? Really? Why don't you do it? Well, it's not my wedding. No, it's, I don't care. And yet you still have an opinion on it somehow. NTA. NTA. Don, yeah. I mean, in the traditional sense, the dad would be the one who who is paying for his daughter's wedding, right? So he's not having to contribute to that at all. I think he can afford to put himself up in a hotel for a couple of nights. Yeah, you don't you don't need you don't need the added stress of a family staying in your house the week of your wedding. That is no bueno. Hey there, it's Dusty Thunder again with another Reddit story for you. This one is, am I the astronaut because I won't pay to continue housekeeping services for my wife? My wife is someone who has always had a housekeeper from a young age. When we first discussed moving in together before marriage, the division of chores was a hot topic. 
I was on team, we can do it ourselves, and she wanted to keep using the housekeeping service she had. Ultimately, I had agreed to the housekeeping service after both of our parents told me it would be easier to agree to make her happy. My only thing was that it was a service she was responsible for paying for. She started out having them come every other week, then once a week to every other day to keep the house as clean as she liked it and do things like her laundry and emptying the trash in her hobby room. Mid-January, my wife was let go and her company downsized. She's been having a hard time finding a job in her field. For now, she's working part-time at retail. We weren't making amazing money before she was let go, but we live comfortably due in part to living below our means for the most part. Since her current job doesn't pay much, I said that I would cover all of our joint expenses, for example, mortgage, property tax, utilities, and our phones so she doesn't have to deplete her savings and our savings won't suffer as much either. She paid for the cleaning service in February, but then yesterday asked me if I was going to set up a direct pay with the cleaning company or transfer her the money to keep paying them. It's $190 a week. I told her neither. The housekeeping service was something that she wanted and was responsible for. If she can't afford it anymore without dropping her savings below a point she's comfortable with, then we don't need it. And I'm not going to pay for something two able-bodied adults are perfectly capable of doing themselves. We argued. She says, I know how much she hates cleaning and that it stresses her out. And since the housekeeper cleaned up areas like the kitchen and living room and made the bed sometimes, I was benefiting from it. So it counts as a joint expense. I told her it doesn't count because I'm perfectly happy to clean up after myself and have cleaned rooms before when they needed it between visits. Fast forward to today, and she thinks I'm still being a jerk by not paying for it. Am I being an asshole anywhere here? Edited to add, I've been doing housework even with the housekeeper. I do my laundry, I make our bed most days, I clean up after our pets, clean the kitchen after we cook, and that includes the oven, stove, microwave. I take out the trash and recycling and clean the AC filters, I dust between visits, I'll sweep and clean the bathrooms between visits, clean up the shower and sinks after each use, I pick up after myself. Most of what the housekeeper does is already done by the time she shows up. If my wife is home, then it's her mess that gets cleaned up, or her clothes, plates, and items that she leaves around. The housekeeper also cleans her hobby room, does her laundry, and whatever else my wife asks. She's just used to having a daily cleaner due to her childhood. So the question here is, am I the astronaut because I won't pay to continue housekeeping services for my wife? Um, Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's an NTA because... <sighs> Because you don't have the ability to sustain that right now. It it there's a there's a blurry line between it being like a luxury and a necessity, right? She views it as a necessity because the way she's lived her life to this point, she always had that resource to be able to lean on. Now, I will say I advocated for a long, long, long time uh for Candy Thunder to let us bring someone in to help with cleaning stuff every like one day every other week. Um, and she was extremely opposed to it for a long time. I finally won that battle. And now she says it's the best thing we've ever done in our life. Here's why there. Well, obviously our lives are crazy, hectic and busy, right? And that, that is a, that is a contrast here. So if, um, they don't have kids, they have, you know, they have more time to be able to knock these kind of things out, but what gets triggered whenever, you know, you have a housekeeper or a cleaning person coming is that you scramble and do a lot of cleaning yourself, which is so it creates some accountability on our end to be able to at least once every every other week do a hurried round of, of cleanup and putting stuff away. We're more likely to keep things cleaner if uh, if that kind of thing happens. In their case here, they finally hit a point where they just can't sustain it. And if it's something that they can't afford, they can't afford. The flip side of that coin is what is your time worth, right? I would actually have to do the math here and I would say, okay, these are the tasks that this person is doing. I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to try to do it myself for a couple months or whatever it is and actually measure the time that it takes me and then compare that to the amount that you pay for it and say, is my time worth more per hour doing something different? Can I be applying this time to actually focusing on something that makes money uh, and and save money essentially by letting someone else do this? There is there is that balance in there that has to happen at some point, and everybody's time is valuable. How valuable it is depends on a number of different factors. But I would mathematically have to evaluate it here. And OP's stance on it that is just a just a flat out. This is a luxury. Uh, this is a luxury that you got used to. I'm not paying to keep it going. I would actually do some scientific testing with, I would test out and see if it is mathematically worth it. Um, or, or if it's something that is truly a luxury there, 
in which case you can pause it and then come back whenever you're able to do it again. You can do that. So this is a you got to get on the same page uh, and have at least some kind of agreed approach here. Obviously, she doesn't like to do this kind of stuff, and that's OK. But OP, you have to understand that if you're saying no to this, that you're going to be picking up the slack on this kind of thing. So, and you can try to, you can try to get her, her looped in on helping you do things too. just expect a lot of opposition there. So it's, you're an NTA here, uh, but you're going to have a lot of opposition moving forward. And before you get firm on saying, hell no, this is definitely not something we're going to do. I would apply some math to it first and actually do some measuring and see if, if the time value in it is actually mathematically efficient for for you to have someone else do it and and again that depends on a lot of things so so yeah not every other day i mean you could definitely cut if she's to the point where she's got somebody coming every other day but it started off every other week time to kick it back to every other week and you can do the in-between stuff for now or once a month or whatever it is there needs to be some kind of adjustment there um and i there has to be a little bit of give and take from both sides here right she's in a pickle and knows that that She's not making as much as she was, so there has to be some some give on her end here. I also think on OP's end here, having this firm line of the sand and saying absolutely no way, there needs to be a little bit more thought put into to determine if it's something that's uh, that's that it's something that they can actually do more efficiently. He says two able-bodied people can do this. Yeah, okay, yeah, of course, uh, two able-bodied people can also replace your roof, but you hire people to do that. So I'm just saying. It, it's something worth evaluating a little bit closer and a little bit more critically before just saying just hard no, right? At least that's how I would approach it. Uh, pretty darn yarn, but also she sounds kind of childish, but I don't want it because I don't like it. Agreed. And her background has everything to do with that, right? She had she she's had help uh, at home ever since she was a kid, and I'm sure that is a lifestyle that is hard to break. So there's going to be there's going to be some shock to the system going on there. But that's also one of the harsh realities of the world, right? Like you, you can only afford what you can only afford. And at least OP has this pragmatic approach and is, is saying, look, if it's going to dip you below a point that you're comfortable with in your savings, then you've got to, you got to find a way to prevent that from happening. So it's got the foresight to say, we need to cut these things out. Now, um, I think there might be a scenario here where it's more efficient than OP is thinking that it is, but that would require some testing. Alrighty, our next story is from the AITA subreddit and is titled, Am I the Astronaut for Throwing a Piece of Popcorn at Someone Who Kept Using Their Phone During a Movie? I hope they pulled it out of one of those Dune popcorn buckets that have been a hot topic of discussion here in the studio today. They're interesting looking. The title is pretty self-explanatory, but here are the details. We went to see Dune 2. Holy hell. It was one of the, maybe. They didn't have the cool popcorn buckets here, Caden Thunder says. So, Yeah. It's it's uber relevant. We went to see Dune 2, highly recommend, last night in a VIP theater with comfy seats and table service, which I mentioned because to attend, you must be 19 plus. They serve real drinks. Seated two rows ahead of us were three young women, 19 to 22, I'd guess. They didn't shut up during any of the previews and spoke loudly to each other throughout the movie, which is annoying, but unfortunately, hardly unique these days. But what was incredibly annoying, starting at about 20 minutes into the movie, one of them got onto her phone. She was only two rows ahead of us, and it was full brightness, so it'd be an understatement to say it was distracting. She'd text, scroll Instagram, watch TikTok videos for a few minutes, then put it down. Ten minutes later, out came the phone again. After the third time, I said quite loudly, Put the phone away! She looked back, gave me a look like, Shut the f*** up, old man, but put it down. And then 10 minutes later, pulled it out again, again, full brightness. So I got a piece of popcorn and threw it at her, hit her on the head. And as you can imagine, she turned around. Are you serious right now? Yeah, I'm serious. Can't you live without your phone for a couple of hours? Shh, said someone. Shut up, said someone else. She put it away. And then maybe 20 minutes later, out it came again. 
I threw another piece of popcorn, which barely missed, but flew by her face. She put the phone away and it stayed away for the rest of the movie. Nobody stood, nobody clapped, nobody really cared. And that might have been the end of it, except after the movie, she quite bluntly said to her friend as we were walking out looking at me, that's the asshole. In telling others about this this morning, I've come to understand that movie theater etiquette has changed from when I was 20. Back then, of course, there weren't phones, but it was unheard of to engage in behavior that would be distracting to others. And when phones appeared 30 years ago, you'd never get on it during the movie. And if you had to, you'd walk out and deal with it. But these days, this is par for the course. Anyway, if I'm paying $25 per ticket plus food and drinks, expensive, plus parking for a night out and a true theater experience, I'd like to enjoy it with what I think is the environment all of that deserves. I can watch movies at home and get on my phone all I want for free. This is supposed to be different. Am I out of touch? Am I the astronaut? Is this okay these days? And maybe that behavior is not okay, but am I the astronaut for throwing a couple of popcorn kernels at someone? It was certainly effective. Interesting. Let's hear what you think here, chat. All right, let's let's talk first about phone usage at movie theaters. Uh, also, let's talk about phones being on full brightness and full volume all the time instead of like adaptive brightness or, you know, not having it at what I call grandma volume uh, all the time. That's something. Yeah, you can get them kicked out by by talking to staff. You could report them, and then they have ushers that are that would actually come come address it. Okay, so I think we have a consensus. It is it's not okay to use use your phone during the during the movie. Uh, what about throwing the piece of popcorn, trying to get her to stop? Is that an asshole move? I think this is an addiction issue. From from the way that OP describes the behavior, it's like every 20 minutes. It's just like by habit that phone comes out. It's like she got bored in her mind in the instant that she got bored. Uh, her, her reaction was to pull out the phone. I think that's an addiction issue. Not an asshole. Not an asshole. She's a child. Not that not that serious. Big fan of mind your business. <laughs> just talk to the staff. Phones are everywhere. Yeah, but I mean, in a movie theater, when you know that you are distracting people behind you because they've spoken up about it and you continue doing it, uh, quoting Stevie Wonder from one of the first podcasts we did, if you're made aware that you could do something differently or better and you choose not to do it, then you're making a choice to be an asshole. She made a choice to be an asshole. I do think there's an addiction issue here that she, she doesn't have control over it anymore. She just that phone is an addiction. If you can't leave your phone down, stay home. I would agree with that. I think it, I mean, every, I think we have a consensus that, that using your phone, especially full brightness during movie. I mean, look, if you got kids and you need to pull it out to check a message real quick, that's fine. Don't have it on full brightness. Don't have it on full volume and don't be an asshole about it. In this case, it was repeated. It was repeated. So the drastic measure he chose to take was to throw a piece of popcorn, which is harmless. Uh, And who cares that she called you an asshole? Who cares? Let me reset this. We've got a lot of NTAs going here. Maybe, maybe I'm going soft after the 24 hour stream and we have a lot of people who are just NTA. Uh, but, but look, it's pull your phone out to check it real quick or something. This was, this was, um, tr- boredom triggered addiction and, and just being completely oblivious to your surroundings or not giving a shit, uh, that you are offending people around you because she knew it was offensive, but still kept doing it. So it just didn't give a shit, right? They could have went and reported it. And actually, that probably is the should have done because it actually would have changed something. If an usher came down with a flashlight and was like, yo, keep it put away or we're going to have to ask you to leave. It probably would not have happened again. She didn't respect OP enough to actually listen to them or respect their wishes. Um, And probably in large part because of of the approach of throwing popcorn that just escalated things. Right. There's escalation and then then there's solution. So. Maybe, maybe OP actually is a four. I'm not going to give them that because uh, it would piss me off pretty good too. This story is from the AITA subreddit as well. And it's titled, Will I Be the Asconaut If I Bought a Car Without My Partner's Blessing? Interesting choice for Candy Thunder's feedback, Tony Spark. Yes. I, 34 female, have always wanted an SUV Porsche since I was a girl. 
My husband, 36 male, and I do very well for ourselves. We earn over a little 150K each, so a combined household income of over 300K. Unlike my partner, I grew up poor from absent, uneducated migrant parents. I worked hard with little support, put myself through school, and climbed the career ladder. When I was younger, my best friend had the life I was so envious of. Loving parents, a warm home, and security. I aspired to be like her mom, a gorgeous woman who openly loved her kids and was active in their lives. She also drove a Porsche, as well as a lot of other rich soccer moms. It became the thing I wanted to have since, the made it item. I'm not a materialistic person. I do not own or care for luxury brands. I do not gamble. My dad continuously lost the family savings, do drugs, or have money pit hobbies. I currently drive a 1999 Toyota that refuses to die, while my husband drives a sports car he bought for around 70k before we met. When we married, I brought a I brought about 60k more into the relationship. Our finances are completely combined, and we're lucky that we don't need to think or worry about finances. Besides our home, which is fully offset, we have no other debts. We are expecting our first child and looking into buying an SUV and replacing my death trap. He is the car person, and I am not. I want to buy a Porsche while he is strongly against it, despite knowing my reasons as mentioned. These are his reasons. One, you are paying for the brand. I know. Two, other cars in that price range offer way more features. It doesn't even compare to what's on the market in terms of tech safety and inclusions. Three, it doesn't have a lot of room or boot space. Four, it does not offer a comfortable driving experience. There are more reasons, but those are the main ones. He's happy to support us in car buying within that price range, his preference being a Volvo or a Lexus. I understand that his reasons are valid and no, my desire for this car is emotionally driven. I don't even know. I don't even care if it's secondhand, but he also strongly is against this. I feel like I deserve this one materialistic thing my heart wants and that I've worked hard to be in a position to afford it. So before I potentially do something irreversibly, will I be the astronaut if I put my foot down, tell him I'm buying this car and go to the dealership and buy it myself without his agreement? Edit. Edit to add that it would be an SUV, ideally the Cayenne or Cayenne, how you, however you say it, but happy if it was the Macan. I feel like I'm on a barbecue skewer and y'all are lighting a fire and just getting ready to turn me and put an apple in my mouth. That's what I feel like right now. If the car fits. Candy Thunder. Oh my God, it's Candy Thunder. Hi. I feel like she has to... I don't like your this car is not going to give you that satisfaction that you think it will. It's not going to provide that like that assurance, that security that you're looking for, that you've made it like you've already made it. You have a husband who literally wants to support you in whatever you do. You have a baby on the way. You have you and your husband both make one hundred and fifty K a year. You have made it like you're there. You don't need a Porsche to tell you that you've made it like you should feel that within yourself and not need that from a car. But if you need the car, if you need it and you can afford it and you're fine with secondhand, then maybe get a secondhand Porsche um, and then also a car that has more safety features. I, as a mom who we have five kids, I would not get that car because I would not feel like my kids were safe in that car. I would want something that is built for family, built for a safety, like and I think that you're going to feel that way once you have your baby. I think you're going to be, you're going to want more out of a car than just feeling like you're successful. But he is a $70,000 sports car. Right. So, I mean, we don't know what that is. So, I mean, I mean why with a baby she... on the way, though, I, I think the point is you shouldn't need it. But if you do, and if this is going to, what it's going to do is prove to yourself that that it doesn't fill a void. That it doesn't, it doesn't achieve no. what you think it's going to achieve. No. If you need to prove that to yourself by doing it, then, then. Say that, I think. Say that to your spouse, and and it's great if you can uh, if you can come to an agreement on that. I'm going to tell you from experience right now. You don't want to commit to buying a car without having your spouse <laughs> completely on board before you commit to buying a car. Yeah. It will cause problems. Would, I can tell you. you that how would you know? I'm just saying, theoretically, if. You sound like you know from experience that you shouldn't buy a car. If someone telling. had done that at some point in a previous life before becoming a wiser man, it probably wouldn't have ended well. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it would have created some short-term pain. I'm just saying. I, I don't think this is something that you should go out yeah. and just do. I think if if you feel strongly mm -hmm. that you do need this, then say that and say, look, I just need this thing. I, I may end up hating it. And after that, the next thing that we get when we move on from this, yeah, absolutely. The biggest concern that I have, though, is uh, maintenance. 
Um, mm-hmm. So depending on where you live, we're we're kind of constrained on on the the brands of cars that we can own around here or should own around here because there aren't service centers around. There's uh, not a poor service center around here. So that's one of the big things I would look at. I don't know if you can afford it, then just I don't get two cars. I mean, I don't I just don't think you're going to get what you think you're going to get out of having out of owning this car. Right. I don't think it's going to you can get so many more features and so many more luxuries and like you get more bang for your buck. Go buy a Lexus or something different. I don't know. Here, here's the flip side of the coin, though. Uh, the flip side of the coin is that if she really feels stronger, strongly about this, and she be, and she does because of her up, upbringing, right? He doesn't understand that because he didn't come from the same place. Right. If she really feels strongly about this and she concedes right now, that's something that she may resent later mm-hmm. on that she conceded sure. and didn't do this. And I think I think you have to have the foresight to say right now, look, if I don't do this and prove this to myself, then I'm going to end up resenting resenting not doing it right now and that could end up resenting you so let me prove this to myself uh my my gut says that it's something that she's gonna get you know she's gonna have fun driving it for a little bit and then by the time the baby gets here shortly after mm-hmm. it would be traded in and go for the safer uh the safer <laughs> bigger suv yeah if you don't have like a think about like a car seat if you're gonna go like the duna route with the big wheels on the car seat we did not go that route because it was just too big but if you're gonna do that route you're not gonna have very much room in that back seat and then yeah. if you don't do that route and you need to take a stroller how's that stroller gonna fit in the trunk of your car like he has a sports car so i mean i think or i mean have his car i mean like i guess alley cat was saying give his car away sorry i fell over standing here you're good um <laughs> give or make him trade his car for the family and she gets what she wants. That's what you could. But yeah. but also, I mean, just because it's a sports car doesn't mean that, that you can't tote around kids. I mean, I've been a Subaru WRX lover for a long time and you can fit a car seat comfortably in the back. It has a huge trunk. Okay. It's a grocery getter think, and an ass kicker. <laughs> this is, this is really interesting because I know it's a Porsche SUV, but Porsche SUVs do not have a lot of space in the front. They're more compact, so especially yeah. the Cayenne is very small. You I don't think to, you're going to get more. You get more in a Maxima than you would. Like they're about the same size. But I think it's really funny is that the, um, like cars don't mean a lot to me. Like as long as it looks nice, gets me from point A to point B, like and looks nice. I mean, like isn't like black with dirt. I'm fine with it. I don't care. Um, I'd like to drive it until it's paid off. This guy, like cars mean something to him. He's excited about cars. He likes cars. So like we, we kind of have a different opinion. He's like, get the Porsche, get the Porsche, do what you need to do. (laughs) An Audi RS6 Avant is still my made it car. And I'm like, someday, eh, eh, I'll just drive my car. He wanted to get, he traded our car in because it was like for the newer model, we could get more for our older model. So we put it against the new one when Navy was born. And I was like. Yeah, I was fine with my 2017. It was good. <laughs> I liked it. I enjoyed it. I miss it still. Um, so I think there's just like, I think people are going to have different opinions because for me, cars don't mean that much to me. Like I'm, I'm happy with whatever I'm, I'm going to be in to drive as long as yeah. I can't drive a stick. So. Well, it's their first kid, so they could make it work. Smaller SUV, you yeah. fold down one of the back seats. You can make it work. And hey. I think it's a personal decision. You just have to, you just have to decide, are you willing to put up with the, with the limitations and shortfalls that it has or shortcomings that yeah. it has in order to check that box? Uh, you're probably going to end up finding out afterward that it didn't really check the box for you, even if it does temporarily. But I think there's a pivot that comes after you have kids where like her definition of success right now. And she said, this is the, I made it car, right? Mm -hmm. Her definition of success is going to change wildly because for me in the very beginning, it was freaking Ferraris and airplanes. And I thought that's what it was going to be whenever I made it right now. Making it is is like having the flexibility and time to be able to do stuff with the kids and the uh, family. I think yeah. it comes down to this. If this is something you feel strongly about, say that and say, I need to prove this to myself right now. It's something I need to do for me. Right. Uh, you're going to grow. You're going to grow out of it. You're going to grow past it. But I think the the don't. more dangerous thing to me right now is not doing it and resenting your partner over it. Yeah, That'd be more painful uh, than doing it and finding out you don't love it. Am I the astronaut for not telling our friends that I'm rich? 
I, 25 female, don't like money talk. I keep it private because growing up, I've seen the things people will do for money. I've seen it destroy my brothers. My parents died when I was little, and I was taken in by my grandparents who raised me. It was a very privileged upbringing, but they also raised me to be frugal and grateful for what I have. I'm incredibly grateful for what I have. I don't show it off or anything. I don't care for labels. Most of my clothes are thrifted. My husband, 33, male, and I live well within our means. The problem is our friend group has just found out that I'm rich and they're mad. We've, we had friends over for dinner and the wife of my husband's best friend went into our office to take a private work call. We've let friends take private calls in there before with no issues. She snooped around while in there and found documentation about my trust fund, my investments, etc. When she came out, she was mad and I thought it was just because of the call. So I left her alone and continued cooking. Hold up. Bish goes into your office, snoops and looks at private financial documents and then gets mad at you for not telling you that you had a bunch of money. That smells like bullshit. She started telling everyone that I was actually rich, showing them one of the documents she had taken from the office. So she took a document too. Cool. My husband took it off her and told her it was none of her business. At dinner, she kept going on about me masquerading as poor because I thrift, have a cheap old car, travel in economy, and don't offer to cover the bill when we go out. That's the big one. That's the big one that she's pissed off about. She's like, oh, oh, you're rich, but you're not buying shit for us. She's wealthy because she's not buying shit for you. Our other friends agreed and they were pissed because I've never said that I have money and never offered money when one of them was struggling. We ended up cutting dinner short and asking everyone to leave. These friends sound like ass bags. I've had messages from them, mostly the women, being angry that I never told them I had money. I've even had a couple of requests for money. One has already asked for 50K to cover their student loans because I had my college paid for. I had scholarships that covered everything. My husband has told me just to ignore them and that it's none of their business. His best friend has called and apologized for all this as his wife shouldn't have been snooping. No shit. I've been very much frozen out from the group. I've been told that I won't be invited to anything until I pay my equal share. And by equal share, they mean I pay for everything. Am I the astronaut for not telling my friends I'm rich? No. Because look what happens when they find out. Holy shit. Not only is it none of their damn business, they violated your privacy by snooping, extracting documents from the office, and then showing it around to other people at this freaking dinner party. This is egregious. This is ridiculous. You need new friends. Do you, do you have the right to know how much money any of your friends have? No. No, and the only reason they give a shit is because they want it. Because they're greedy, selfish, dickbag, prick friends. That's it. They're already asking, yeah, we're really mad. If you give us 50K, we'll feel better about it. We're freezing you out from the group until you pay your, your fair share. And by fair share, we mean you pay for everything. Can't imagine why you don't talk about this, OP. Can't imagine. And also living frugally is how you still have money. Something your friends definitely don't understand because they expect you to just give it all away to them. Just by being friends with them, they're somehow entitled to a share of it. Ah, I'm trying in my mind right now to, to like half of me, half of me, maybe more than half is like, I'm glad I'm glad we don't have these kinds of problems, right? I'm glad we don't have to deal with this kind of stuff. Uh, it's not having to these kind of problems. As OP said in the beginning, money brings out the worst in people. I think it is. Uh, it's absolutely true. It does. How hard would it be for her to like start over and just have a f brand new friend group now? And, and how are you going to build that brand new friend group? You're going to have to go start from scratch and do the exact same thing you did before and, and live your life the way that you normally would. It's not like you're trying to deceive people. You're living within your means. You're not trying to deceive anyone. You make choices about how you want to live based on how you want to live. And somehow they've taken that as you've wronged them by deceiving them just because they want some of it though. That's the shitty part. It's just because they want some of it. I don't, I don't, I don't know how you move forward from this OP. Like it seems like it would be a very, very, very isolating experience. It seems like it would be very isolating because you're going to end up if, if people are just innately greedy like this. And every time a friend finds out this shit kind of happens, at what point do you just end up alone and can't talk to anybody because everybody just wants you for your money. It seems very dangerous. 
<laughs> it is no one's business, Juju Girl. But 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 because people are greedy, I think OP is probably going to keep hitting this cycle. I don't know. Hopefully, you can find a group of friends that doesn't give a shit. It's they have no right to anything of yours. They have no right to know anything about your private life. It is, gosh dang, yeah, definitely okay to cut people off. Definitely. Am I the astronaut for cutting off my mother-in-law because she told my daughter she hoped I had died when I was taken to the hospital? She sounds pleasant. I-30 female was in a car crash. I had to be cut out of the car. I wasn't seriously injured, though, thankfully, but the other person, unfortunately, wasn't doing too well from what I saw before I was taken away to the hospital. I was told to stay in the hospital overnight to see if I had suffered from a concussion. I rang my husband and told him what happened. My mother-in-law got the incidents mixed up when he dropped off our daughter, 6 and 11, to my mother-in-law while he rushed to see me. The next morning, my husband brought our daughters to come get while I was waiting to be discharged. Upon seeing my six-year-old, busted into tears and said, I don't want you to die. I comforted her and said, I'm not dying. I was very lucky. She then said, Granny said she hoped I'd die so that, so that they and my husband can come live with her. Me and my husband were shocked, and my 12-year-old confirmed she heard her say that. My husband said he was going to ring mother-in-law. When he came back in the room, he looked furious, but didn't say anything until after we got home. He said mother-in-law denied it, but after he kept pushing, she ended up admitting it. But she said she didn't mean it. (laughs) I thought we were close, but I guess not. I am incredibly hurt she would want that, and said I wanted me and the girls go no contact with mother-in-law. I told him he can have a relationship with her, but I don't want me and the girls to have one with her. My husband said he supports me. He then rang mother-in-law and told her what I said. She didn't take it too well. She came to our house crying and saying it was a misunderstanding and she didn't mean it and that we were taking it the wrong way. Oh, you mean you wished I had died a different way? There's you know, so many ways that you can take that. My husband asked, what did you mean then? She just got hysterical and started crying and saying she always wanted daughters, but my husband was the only child due to her not being able to have any more after him and that the girls are more like her daughters than granddaughters and she didn't think properly when she said that to her six-year-old. You mean you're evil. Got it. She got so worked up that my husband had to take her home. When he got back, he said he didn't know she felt like that and asked if I still wanted to cut her off. I said, yes. He said, okay, and didn't argue. But it's been a week now and he's still very quiet and hasn't said much about what happened. And now I'm starting to feel guilty and wondering if I did take it the wrong way. And am I being the asshole? Before we dive into updates here. What? What? Yeah, this this is this is uh, this. Yeah. But but this this was grief of the grief of not being able to have any additional children. Right. So but to openly say My granddaughters are more like my daughters, and that's why I said I hope their mom would die so they could live with me. That's not a justification. That's that doesn't make it better. That actually makes it a little bit worse because now now it was premeditated, right? Now it was malicious. Now it was um now there's now there's reasoning behind it. It's not like she's just talking crazy. No, she had she had a reason. You get there's no way to take it a good way. There's no way. There's no way. Uh, yeah, she said that to the kids, and now she's expecting to still have a relationship. And the the scary part of this is that hubby comes back, and he's like, you still want to cut her off? Yeah, it's even worse now. What do you mean, do I still not want to talk to her? Of course. I don't want her around our children. What the hell? How has it gotten any better, dude? It hasn't. All right, here's the update. Update number one. Well, you guys were right. I decided to talk to my husband and asked if he was upset that I decided that me and the girls would go no contact with mother-in-law. He said he wasn't. He said he always knew mother-in-law wanted a daughter instead of him, and it brought back all the bad memories of rejection and hurt he felt growing up as a kid. Well, that sucks, but it's better than we thought it was. I suggested therapy, and he's willing to go. We're also going to get therapy for our six-year-old, as she now gets anxious if I'm not within her sight. Thanks, Grandma. My husband agreed that going no contact with mother-in-law is the best thing for our family. Our daughter's birthday is coming up, and we have yet to tell mother-in-law that she is no longer invited. Not looking forward to that, but that's the update. Thanks, everyone, for the lovely comments and support. I appreciate it. <sighs> just don't invite her, and then afterwards, when she found out about when she finds out about the party, just be like, oh, we thought you died. Sorry. We didn't invite you. 
because we thought you were dead. This is just no, but knowing knowing hubby's, knowing the the seeds that that grew into a depression more than him being upset with the wife about wanting to go no, go no contact. That at least helps with solidifying him being on her side and them going no contact in here. Here is update number two. I didn't think I would be posting here again, but here we are. Mother-in-law has been arrested. My husband's cousin found my post and knew it was me, and she reported it straight to mother-in-law. Yeah, we we know it was you who told her, Christina. Margaret told us all about it when she came over and screamed that we can't keep her daughters from her. She didn't even hesitate to drop your name and throw you under the bus. So, so much for loyalty, huh? You are not welcome in my home anymore, and you are officially removed from Sam's birthday list and our lives. How about you show the whole family this post so they can see how two-faced you are? To the Reddit community, sorry about that. My mother-in-law has been arrested. She came to our house screaming that we can't keep her daughters from her. Husband tried to calm her down and get her to leave. She wouldn't and attacked him. My husband had to restrain her, and I called the police. She fought them, but it got nowhere except the back of their car. The woman is truly insane. My husband talked to the police because I had to calm down my daughters. After all, they witnessed the whole thing. My six-year-old was hysterical about Granny being taken away. This is all just a big mess. That's the end of the freaking story. Holy shit. This poor kid, these poor kids, but this six-year-old in particular, who who received the uh, the statement from Grandma in the first place and now witnesses this, like how much heavy shit are these kids going to go through? Everybody needs therapy. Everybody, everybody, everybody. Um, mother-in-law probably needs a 72-hour hold. Mother-in-law has some serious issues. She's a danger to herself and others right now. And and yeah, she has unprocessed grief that is rearing its ugly head in all kinds of crazy ways. I shouldn't use the word crazy, but it's crazy. She needs help, right? This is not healthy. This is not okay. For her to show up and say, those are her daughters and you can't keep them from her. She she's delusional, right? This is this is beyond delulu. This is delusional. This is uh this is dangerous. So that 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 yeah. She definitely needs help. I think it's a great idea to get the the kids some counseling now as well because they've they've been witness to some some pretty hairy shit. Um and then of course OP, you know, you and Hubby seem to be handling everything pretty well. Hubby is probably taking this much worse than he's letting on. He did admit uh, about all the mistreatment in his childhood, rearing its ugly head back up because she always wanted a girl. Um, so he's got some things to process there as well that are now fresh. And, and mom, you might as well go ahead and hop in there too. everybody in therapy, kids, especially and, and granny, obviously. But but the kids, man, they're going to have time. They're going to need some time. They're going to need some time to work through this. Oh, hand that rocks the cradle. Yeah. Uh, where's the father? Uh, so her mother-in-law's husband, father-in-law, they never even mention him. He may, he must not be around. Or he's just like, oh, she's going batshit crazy again. It's fine. It's fine. This story is from the AITA subreddit as well and is titled, Am I the Astronaut for Calling My Mom a Liar and Telling Her and Her Husband to Check Their Expectations? My mom got remarried two years ago, and five years ago, we lost my dad. I, 16, was 11 when he died, and my sister Sky, 14, was 9. My mom's husband, George, is a widower too, technically. Though he was separated from her for a few years and his kids, now 11, 10, and 9, don't know their mom. So this means they feel like they were always missing that perfect nuclear family, while Sky and I already have that. We lost it when our dad died. But that is still our perfect nuclear family, and we did not feel like we were missing out on having another dad, and we didn't wish for more siblings. But mom and George expected me to see all four kids as equal siblings. They expected me to do for my sit my step siblings what I do for Sky. My mom expected me to baby my step siblings the way I used to baby Sky. They expected me to be physically affectionate with my step siblings because I hug Sky and kiss her on the top of the head. I sometimes pick her up when we play fight. They expected all of that because George's kids never had their mom. In December, I had to write a fake will for my homework. I basically left everything to Sky with some stuff for my mom. George read the thing over my shoulder as I finished it up, and he told my mom I didn't leave anything for his kids in this fake will. 
They asked me about it the next day, and I was like, Sky's my sister. Of course, she'd get almost everything. The three of us started therapy after that. They said they noticed that Sky and I don't treat George's kids the same, and the fake will was alarming because it would break the kids' hearts if that were a real scenario. They expressed the importance that I fulfill my obligations as an older sibling and treat them all the same, and most importantly, truly love them all the same. Same for Sky. She should embrace being an older sister, yada, yada, yada. A week ago, mom brought up that I had made a commitment to George's kids when they got married and had signed up to be their brother. They expressed that they expected us to be one whole nuclear family where nobody was treated differently and we all loved each other equally. They said that was what they were going to demand from us as the two oldest and the ones who are not showing that they love everyone. When my time to speak came, I called my mom a liar for saying I had signed up for anything. And I said I never signed off on her getting married or being a sibling to anyone other than Sky. And technically, I didn't sign up for that, but I was because I love Sky. Then I told them to check their expectations before they get out of control because they will never get the family they imagined us to be. I told them that it's not what I want or want to work toward. Mom told me I had no right to call her a liar, and they said it was cruel to share that I had no intention of agreeing to be a good brother to George's kids. That showed how much of a child I am. Am I the astronaut? Look, blended families are tough, right? But I can't imagine ever being in a position where I'm like, yeah, these kids step inside the door and you treat them like you've always been their sibling just immediately. You can't force that. You also can't force love. You can't, you can't force love. That relationship is something that has to build over time. And the more you force it, the, the more they're going to reject it because it's not the kind of thing that you can force right now. You're making it work to have a relationship with their step siblings. You are forcing it on them, which is why they're fighting against it. If you allowed this thing to naturally evolve, it would naturally evolve, but because because OP's mom and stepdad are forcing it on them, it is not. It's it's not going to work. It is not going to work. And yeah, the uh, the question here specifically was, am I the astronaut for calling my mom a liar and telling her and her husband to check their expectations? No, you know why? Because she did lie. She said that you made a commitment and you signed up for this. You didn't. Did you have a choice? I fail to see where you had a choice in any of this at all. You didn't have a choice. Now there's. If they had not crammed this down your throats and and forced this perfect blended family expectation onto you, you probably would be much more amenable to to getting to know your step siblings, to play with them, to do things. But because they're forcing it on you, that's a much slower process. And they have to understand that it is not magic. They don't blend families together and just and just be like, poof, It's like you were always this way. It's not Sophia the first. I'm sorry. It's, and even that was a bit of a process, right? It is not the kind, it, it doesn't work like that. That's not how life works. That's not how blended families work. That's not how nuclear families work. Do you think nuclear, just that complete biological full family sit down there like, hey, you don't love each other equally. And it shows it's time to have a freaking family meeting about it. No. And guess what? Someday, OP, if you're writing an actual will, you have no obligation to leave equal anything to anyone or to include anyone. Nobody is entitled to jack shit. Not an equal share of your love, not an equal share of your money, not an equal share of your possessions of any kind or respect. Nobody is entitled to any of it. And this, I don't know. I don't know where mom and dad got the idea that they were just going to force this down your throat and everything was going to be hunky dory. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Any reasonable person would look at this and be like, yeah, that's not the way. This is not the way. Being a family is tough. Being a blended family is really, really tough. Can you imagine Candy Thunder if we had tried this on our kids? They they would hate each other. Yeah, it, it takes years. It takes years for them to really mesh. And had we tried to force it on them, it would have never happened. There'd be too much pressure on it. No, as teens. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because OP is 16 now. Sister is 14. And there are an 11, 10, and 9-year-old in the mix now, too. And that's really tough because teenagers, there's some natural distance that gets created there anyway. I just can't imagine, can't imagine being a, a parent who would try to force this on somebody, a 16-year-old kid and a 14-year-old kid. It's unreasonable. Unreasonable.
Am I the astronaut for hating cake? What did the cake ever do to you? You can, you know, I mean, you can hate some kinds of cake, but I have never liked cake. Those words just coming out of my mouth feel wrong. It feels wrong to say those words. Hold on, I gotta rinse it down. Blech. Ever since I was a little kid and they tried to feed me cake during birthday parties, I was not into it. It's mushy, it's messy, and usually way too rich. I don't like vanilla cake. I don't like chocolate cake. I don't like cookie cake, ice cream cake, whatever. It's not for me. My entire family constantly berates me for this. They'll call me the cake Scrooge, the cake Grinch, the great cake hater. You name it. They give me crap all the time. It's gotten to the point where it truly grinds my gears. It's my opinion, and I'm ridiculed for it. So I decided to bring a cake to the family dinner, but this cake is two weeks expired. I bought an old one and waited until it was even older and hid that from my family. So I took the cake to dinner and let everyone have a slice. They were happy to see that I had changed my tune about cake, but a few hours later, everyone started to get super sick. I wonder why. I texted the family group chat and let them know my misdeeds. We claimed it? Now everyone has bad cake memories. Now they get it. Does this make me horrible? Maybe, but I don't care. I got my revenge. Well, damn. Uh, damn. Does it make me horrible? Maybe, but I don't care. So accepting that it was a horrible thing to do kind of solidifies everything we need to know there. It was a terrible shit thing to do. Intentionally making people sick so that they adopt your opinions doesn't seem like the right call at all. Also, you're entitled to your opinion. Like, if you don't like cake, that's fine. We've got, well, you know, one of the kids doesn't like chocolate stuff. It's just, it's just how it is. It's fine. Everybody has different tastes. Not liking cake doesn't. It, it's fine. Super childish, honestly. Who does that? Isn't that a crime? Probably is. If people got sick and had to be like, uh, had to be hospitalized, they probably, yeah, OP's probably in some like serious criminal trouble here. It's not, uh, yeah. What did the cake ever do to, to them? You know, it, everybody has bad cake memories. There's something, he says, ever since I was a little kid and they tried to feed it to me during birthday parties, I was not into it. And that's fine, you know? Uh, mushy, messy, and usually way too rich could be. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Could be a sensory thing for them. They, for whatever reason, they don't like it. It, it was not, <laughs> does not give them to rights to essentially try to poison a bunch of people who do like cake. It's even if they did ridicule you, it's not, it's that's not causation to go ahead and try to, you know, end them or at least make them really, really sick. It's not, uh, not cool. I w wouldn't, wouldn't advise doing that. I think, you know, talking Talking through that problem would probably be the preferred way to go. Yeah. Did they force them to eat it? I, they, they say they tried to feed me cake during birthday parties. That's a bit about the extent of it. But it's also calling them the the cake Grinch, the cake Scrooge, the great cake hater. Ew. Definitely not a good thing to do. Don't do it.